we're talking actors and directors who put on the show. We're talking playwrights and designers who you'll want to know. From the very first rehearsal to the final curtain call, we, we might, might be off, 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 off Broadway, but we're talking about it all. Cause we're two local gals with global pals. It's everything, everything, everything here. With Benita and Ellen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Everything Theater Podcast, the podcast where we talk about everything theater. Hi, everybody. I'm Benita Zahn. And I'm Ellen Krebs. And yeah, I'm really, I am so excited about our guest today. Yeah, look, I'm excited about them all, but particularly excited about our guest today, having a connection to the theater. And I'm so happy to see it blossoming. Thank you. We are Ooh. talking with Kyle West. <laughs> That's me. Our cheap cook and bottle washer. <laughs> everything else at the Fort Salem Theater. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So you uh, take over the theater in 2020 as the world is going bleh, and you want to make a splash. Talk to us about that time, Kyle. Oh, did did everybody not buy a theater during a pandemic? I thought that's I thought that was the plan, but. Uh, no, it's, it's been a really wild ride. Um, and of course being kind of the new guy in town and, uh, you know, with all the changes in the world, this question comes up a lot and I feel like there's no perfect way to explain how I got here. Um, but I, I feel like as we were all stuck in our homes, uh, a year ago, 10 years ago, I don't really remember when this all started at this point, um, I think we all miss theater so much. And as I as I sat at home wondering how I, you know, what the future of theater looked like for me, uh, what uh, I could contribute to the theater in the future, I realized how much we would all need a, a space, uh, a, a, a way to start the conversation, uh, a, a place to all come back to uh, when it was safe to do so. Um, and I've worked my entire life in the industry and having a home that I could invite people into when this was over was so powerful to me. Um, and knowing the opportunities that have been given to me, just thinking, okay, maybe I can start offering opportunities and start conversations uh, when this is all over, you know, was, was a, big, a big moment for me. Uh, and theater historically has always come back. So I, I knew it would, I knew we'd be hungry for it. Kyle, you have been a producer, a director, a choreographer, a designer, a performer. You've won awards in pretty much every one of those arenas. But to own a theater is a whole nother smoke. Was that always percolating or did you and uh, your husband, Jared, at some point say, you know, the Judy Garland, you know, moment, you know, I've got an old refrigerator box and, you know, there's curtains somewhere, but I think we need this for us. H how do you come to that from your background? So my parents have always been business owners and entrepreneurs. So I think I always knew I wanted um I wanted to, to own something. I wanted to build something and be a part of, uh, of something in that capacity. Um, and for the last two years that I lived in Dallas before moving here, I had considered, uh, is there a theater space? I had looked around. Um, the spark for that actually was uh, a friend of mine pointed out, listen, you're, you're always the first to arrive. You are the last to leave. Um, why aren't you, you know, why aren't you, running a space? Why aren't you managing this? Uh, and I thought, you know, why, why, why am I not? Um, and the, with our, our jobs kind of shifting <laughs> based on the pandemic, we realized, you know, maybe we're not stuck in one place. Let, let's look across the world. I hadn't found a space in Dallas. Uh, Dallas, fortunately, has a huge theater scene, and I just didn't feel like uh, there was something special I could contribute there uh, with the, the, the both the quality and quantity that existed. It was a really good problem to have. And I just didn't feel like it needed uh, me to be in that space. Uh, and we kind of lucked upon this. Uh, we, we found it online uh, and fell in love very quickly. 
And it was it was a very easy uh, decision to make once the once the idea was there and the right space spoke to us. So um, I don't know that we would have landed in a small town in upstate New York had it not been for the pandemic. Um, but I do think that perhaps uh, someday, some way, I would have been uh, wearing all these hats uh, in some capacity. You know, the theater has always been loved. It goes back to, it was built and burnt and built and burnt in the 1770s. And then in 72, by way of history, Judge William Drohan from New York City bought it. And he was an erstwhile actor as well. And he replaced the altar with the stage. I wonder how that went over in, in Salem. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, and started doing theater. And then Quentin Beaver bought it in 1979. And a lot of folks in this area remember when the Beaver family was there. And then Quentin's daughter, Kathy, took it over. And then Jay Kerr came in in 2006 and bought it. And that was my introduction there. And um, that's when big renovations, you know, he made the chapel into the cabaret. And I can remember coming in and he was in the process of redoing the main stage and I walked in and I couldn't walk in. He said, let me show you what's here. And the chairs, he had chairs from the Helen Hayes Theater were going into a place. And I stopped and he looked at me, he goes, what's the matter? I go, it's the ghosts. They're checking <laughs> me out. I can't walk in yet. I swear, you know, there's ghosts there. You know that. <laughs> um, and they're very protective of the theater. And... Um, and then it was time, that was 06, and we did a lot of stuff there, a lot of cabaret singing I did there. And then, you know, it was time for them to move on. So let me let me do the paranormal. Um, did, that, did you feel, have you and the ghosts met each other? Have they checked you out? Not at all, which is so funny because so many people, everybody asks that question. That is like the second question. Oh, what about the ghosts? And nothing, nothing whatsoever. So hopefully that means they're happy. Because Maybe they gave up the ghost. Apparently, yeah, they they were not negotiated in the sale of the building. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> and you've been up into the costume area. Oh yes, I wouldn't even go there. I was like, mm. <laughs> well, if if they decide to come back, they're very nice. You'll meet them in the bomb. Okay, I'll yeah. I'll have them call you first. No, 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 really, I'll give them Jessica Layton's <laughs> phone number. It's okay. She felt perfect. Me. But that's great. So talk about being embraced, and then wow, what a season you've had. Yeah, it's been, it, it's, I am, I, I say this a lot and I feel like it, it can't come across as sincere as I mean it, but it has been overwhelming how supportive people have been. Um, I hoped people would come because theaters in general were, were reopening. I hoped people would come because uh, they valued Fort Salem theater, uh, but for people to, to kind of come out in the way that they have, uh, both in terms of just being audience members or sharing stories. And everybody has uh, really incredible stories, um, whether they performed or their kids did or what they saw there. Uh, and it has been a really special place for a lot of people. And it's, again, it's the, the phrase that keeps coming to mind is it's been overwhelming how just terrific people have been about it. You have, have Ellen, have you ever been up? I, I haven't yet. No, I'm I'm kind of still newish to the area. So Fort Salem is one I have not had the pleasure of visiting yet. So I'm excited to go check it out. Yeah, it's it's a really cool space. So you've done the marvelous one dress, next to normal, Patsy Klein, Diary of Anne Frank. Am I missing anything? Um, so with uh, in the community, we uh, co-produced a production of Schoolhouse Rock for the students during the summer. Um, and we hosted a reading of Kimmerer Lamoth, uh, Lamoth's Nietzsche, uh, which I'm always concerned I'm going to say wrong, so I, I pause each time. Um, so it was a, her brand new musical that we hosted uh, this summer as well. I think, I think that, and we kicked off our season with Salem Under the Stars, a little outdoor concert on the farm down the street. So I think it's been six so far. It's since June. It's a, it's been it's been a lot. <laughs> Now, with having such a pause um, in the theater in general, and you're talking about the, the drive to, you know, have something and tell your stories, it, it, is there certain uh, plays and productions that you're more drawn to at this time in particular in the, in the theater world where everything has been on such pause and upheaval? Yes, and um, it, it's been interesting just planning a season, and I'm sure, uh, 
any any director or creator probably has similar thoughts recently, but not just thinking of artistically what uh, I value and uh, as a from an entertainment standpoint, what I enjoy, but what can we produce uh, that we feel is safe in this environment? Uh, so a lot of our, a lot of what I had initially thought, oh, we'll come in and we'll uh, you know revisit these. Uh, familiar shows that you know people loved seeing back in the Beavers days, and then we'll do a little bit of kind of the bread and butter of what Jay did and marry it all together, and then introduce what we do well. Uh, and then we had to pause and say, okay, what what details are most important right now? And obviously, the, we're here because we tell stories and we're passionate about that. But also, what can I do with a small cast? What is safe on stage and backstage? Um, and something, and this has been a conversation I, I've not had a ton, but something I've thought of a lot is how in 2021 uh, do we tell stories that people need to hear and want to hear without being political in a way that uh, is, is maybe exhausting right now? Um, I think the Diary of Anne Frank, uh, as an example, was a really good experience for our audience because uh, just looking at the, from a government standpoint, uh, you know, different opinions on that side, but also even just from a literal being in quarantine, sheltering in place, and being able to revisit that experience without having to say those words, and uh, and and I think it gave us a really unique opportunity to say, oh, we understand this in a different way today uh, than we did ten years ago, without ever having to say a word about you know, where we kind of are in the world right now. Um, but at the same time, we also needed a Marvelous Wonderettes where we could just get out and kind of sing and dance and and step away from the, from, I don't want to say step away from a message because uh, storytelling is, is why I love theater, but uh, just to realize, oh, sharing this experience and being able to sit back and enjoy art as a group of people has so much value. You know, um, some weeks, months ago, we interviewed David Kenner uh, from New York City. And Ellen, help me, the, his theater is? Um, oh my gosh, wow. Okay, not just Total me blank. Right now. We, we always do this, it's I'm going, we do. <laughs> um, but he's got a theater in New York. Um, we had the good fortune to perform with him in uh, at uh, Capitol Rep. And as theater was reopening, and this was really on the, the cusp of it reopening, the whole push he said was for lighthearted, if you will, but fun, entertainment, non, you know, stuff that you didn't have to do a heavy emotional lift for because of what we'd come through. And I wonder if in the six or eight months since we've talked with David, and I agree with him, I, I think back at that point, that was the key if we have morphed a little bit back into hearing some of the more weighty stories that we're ready for that now. What do you I think? think? I think so. I think, you know, I think there's an important balance in there. I think sometimes we need and want to be purely entertained. Uh, and I think, you know, th just that experience that as artists and creators, we all have with uh, understanding where we are and who we are through seeing somebody else's story. Uh, you know, I think that's an experience we can't get away from in theater. So I, I think that balance, I think having uh, different opportunities to kind of sit back and, and take in both of those worlds is so important. Um, I, I did wonder about that though with Next to Normal. I was like, are we ready to, to kind of dive in and talk about mental health uh, as our mental health has probably all been challenged. Uh, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't know if it would go over well, um, but I knew that artistically it was something that I did well. And I knew I only had a, a limited window to introduce myself as an artist to the community. Uh, so I figured, hey, this is, this is my chance. I gave, I, I gave you, that's not fair. I, I uh, brought you uh, Marvelous Wonderettes uh, and, and now let me show you what I do. And I found that there were people that, you know, certainly gravitated one way or the other, but as a whole, people were willing to just kind of sit back and say, okay, let's talk again. Let's think about this. Um, 
And that's kind of the magic that happens when we all get in the get in the room together. Uh, and we don't have to talk because they're doing it for us. Room to all in the room together. Now we're going to talk high knees in the seats. So what are you doing? Do you have to show a vaccine? Or what about masks, hand sanitizing? Give us the 411. Yeah, so uh, it has been a roller coaster. Um, when we originally opened, uh, we were only at 33%, uh, which in rehearsals, uh, I think was the, the requirement, but opened up. Uh, sooner than we were comfortable. So we stuck to that for a little while. Um, but uh, at this point, we've uh, decided only to go to 70% right now. Our center section uh, is mm, not 100% full, but available. And in the side sections, we continue to do every other row. So people do have the opportunity to be a little more distant if they'd prefer. Um, but absolutely everybody in the building is vaccinated. Uh, we do check it before the show. Uh, so you, you don't even email it to us in advance. I, I've been personally standing at the front step uh, and just, you know, checking with each person. Masks are required. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I thought it was going to be a lot more stressful than it is. Um, people have been so hungry to get back out in the world. Uh, and, and perhaps people that are artistically inclined uh, are just that much more understanding, but it has been very rare that somebody has not been a thousand percent supportive. Uh, more often than not, I, I hear people say that they're comfortable being there because of those requirements. Um, and I think there's been a, a, an extremely positive response because they see us enforcing it as well. They walk up to the theater and they see walking down the street, okay, you are going to check this when I get there. Um, in theater, the worst thing we ever want to do is turn somebody away, and it has been really difficult the few times we have had to. Um, but on the flip side, I've also been able to teach a lot of our older patrons how to download the Excelsior Pass app, how to look up that. And I feel like in a cool way, like that's an, an extra service we've been able to say like, hey, you, you're going to need this as we reintroduce ourselves to the world. And let me let me show, let me literally stand here and show you how to do it. Um, unfortunately, if you if you can't, we can't let you in today. But um, I found that that was kind of a neat uh, experience with these this community that I'm still getting to know. So uh, it's definitely tricky for sure. And who knows? We'll you know we're open to changing, uh, you know, ebbing and flowing with our policies as the world changes. Obviously, we we hope to go in one direction, but we are. Uh, very prepared uh, and and continuing the conversation of what is the safest today. So it, it's a long drive. Yeah, I've made it many times, and you know I'm really you know you watch for the deer on your way home. <laughs> yep. Um, how long are you keeping the theater open into the winter? So right now we have performances uh, up through the second week of December. Um, which is a bit of a stretch in terms of just the season. Uh, in fact, our, our show is called There's No Business Like Snow Business, uh, which I hope is not uh, any, any bad omen in terms of the weather that brings us uh, there. Um, but we, we've had people ask, you know, is there an opportunity for this to be a year round experience? And, uh, you know, as, a, as just putting my business owner hat on, it will take realistically, two years plus to understand, uh, you know, what people are looking for and what is the right fit. And um, I, I realize again, this is my window for that trial and error. And maybe December is, does not work out for us in terms of, of weather, um, but maybe it's also an opportunity, you know, for people in our area that don't have a lot of other things going on in December to, to kind of come out and when they don't have you know, all of their other conflicts. So we do want to, to give that a shot and see. Uh, next season, um, we might do something for Valentine's Day, but in terms of main stage content, we're looking at March through November, December again. So <sighs> I'm, we're in the middle of that right now, but uh, knock on wood. What's that? Give us a little preview. What are you looking at? Oh gosh. So 
uh, going back to what I had said earlier, we're trying to kind of find this marriage between, you know, the big familiar titles that people are passionate about uh, back from the summer stock days, uh, which is also a really great way to introduce no, new folks to theater. Uh, it, it, it gets families in, it gets people to say, hey, this is familiar and I'm, and I'm comfortable going. Uh, and then hopefully that allows them uh, the 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 comfort to come in for new works and and smaller productions that might not be those uh, household titles household names uh, so we do want to do a little bit of both um, in terms of the bigger titles what's been really challenging is that every producer in the country wants to open the door to the productions that put butts in seats uh, you know we had looked at fiddler on the roof uh, as a, a great way to uh introduce some opportunities for maybe entry-level performers with experienced performers um, with, with a wide range of, of artists. Um, and of course, it's not available because shows like Fiddler are, I don't want to say easy to go back on the road, but uh, it, it's easy in terms of selling it across the country. So uh, those big names are really kind of hard to get right now. So uh, let's see, what can I... Do I have any previews I can give you? <laughs> it has changed so much in the last month. Um, so I, I honestly, because we're in the middle of, of contracts, I don't even know what, I would drop something if I had a, I know this is happening. Um, okay, but, so uh, what's on your, if I had a magic wand list? I mean, in terms well, of- They like, actually have the magic wand, we're just- <laughs> I, I don't have a magic wand that I know of, but um, you know, there are some of the bigger titles I want to do. I'm dying to dive into Cabaret again, which I know you just got to work on. Um, we're in the midst of that now. Oh, that's right, that's right. Go up um, uh, the second and third weekend in November. And yes, I, I need to be there. Like doing, uh, yeah, come down. It's sort of like doing Anne Frank at this time. It is. Because of the, clear, clearly this is not, a show to make people feel good, but the overlay of what's happening in, not only in this country, but in the world, lets you know in the world, it's uh, an interesting time. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, Cabaret, okay. So, yeah, Cabaret is definitely on my, you know, it, in the foreseeable future, artistically, I have to dive in. Um, I'd mentioned Fiddler, uh, you know, I, I do think it's one that really, it, it's a great, it's opportunity a big for families. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And that's, uh, that was also, it was on our, it was on my initial plan for this year. And then as I actually started applying for contracts, I was like, no way, I'm not getting 30 people backstage uh, <laughs> right now. Um, it's not that big backstage. <laughs> oh, it, it's not. I know that for <laughs> sure. Um, I feel like I'm being really vague with you and it's not because I intend to be, but because I have had to revisit this conversation so much, just considering what is available and what I, I personally feel safe with right now. Um, but I think what I, you know, if you were to ask my peers what I'm, uh, what I do well, it is often like the big song and dance musicals. Uh, the, the regional gigs I, I get called for are, are the hairsprays or I've done Guys and Dolls six times, Joseph. Uh, th those are the ones that I think um, are, are, are in my back pocket uh, mm -hmm. and I hope to kind of share those. But anything, things like Cabaret that are really great plays that just happen to have kick ass. Oh, can I say that? <laughs> we'll have really good <laughs> scores on top of them. I love diving into those. So. Now, kind of related to that question, because um, among your many, many hats you wear, you've done a lot of talks about theater marketing and social media strategy. And Benita and I have this conversation all the time on the podcast of like, how do you uh, appeal to especially a, a younger audience, a more diverse audience that may not be the theater going crowd that we all know and love. Um, so do you have any kind of tips for our listeners in terms of how you find that balance of, you know, choosing shows and reaching out to the community? Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think a key part of that as basic as the sound is, as you mentioned, social media uh, is really powerful in our industry. And I think that uh, a lot of theaters or just a lot of businesses, to be fair, uh, view social media as only a young communication device. And it's not. 
uh, you know, a lot of our, our parents and our grandparents and a lot of older generations are on social media, even if they're not interacting in the way uh, that a younger audience might be. Um, my like social media strategy or my marketing strategy as I'm communicating a show is learning to speak as if I am the show. What is the voice of that show? How does uh, that show sound? Um, how can I interact in a way that I am talking with people about this show and not at them about this show? Um, and I think that's kind of the fun of marketing and theater is that we do get to have lots of voices and get to be creative and we're storytellers. So how can we talk about this story again in a way that you and I are talking about it together and I'm not talking at you about it? Hmm. Um, what's the voice of the story? Who are the characters? That's, uh, that's kind of where I get into in my head. Um, and I think it's, I think it's, if I, if I'm having fun with it, hopefully you'll have fun reading it, uh, whether it is social media or an e-blast or even just an article in the newspaper. If I'm communicating my joy, I hope in turn you feel that and want to reciprocate in that way. So. Ellen. They so were, we're, we're wrapping up to our end of our time here. So we're going to move on to our, our close-up segment. Uh, these are some rapid fire questions all about you. Oh no. Oh gosh. So, I hope I get the damn right then. Oh, you hopefully. So Kyle, are you ready for your close-up? Absolutely. Sweet. So first tell us, um, what was the moment in your life when you just knew I have to do theater? Oh gosh. Uh, always. I, I think always. Uh, for me, I grew up as a performer. I'll make this very quick. I grew up as a musical theater performer and a ballet dancer. And I realized very quickly um, that I loved every second of it. I liked helping set up chairs for the read through. I, I would help sharpen pencils. I liked every second of it. And that's when I realized not only was it not just the opening night, the curtain call, the, the applause, but it was the entire experience. And I have just never known a life without that. So always. What did your family think when you said, I'm going to go do theater? Uh, they could not be more supportive, although they have virtually no uh, theater history. Uh, I think they saw a play here and there. Uh, they've, they've helped out. My mom has done props. She's helped with costumes. My dad has helped find things. Uh, but beyond me liking it, they've, they would have no reason to enjoy it. But uh, they've been here two dozen times since we've opened, they, they're thrilled. Is there a particular show or production that had a huge impact on you uh, either uh, growing up or recently and, and why? Um, this is, it's funny, if, if you asked, if I knew this question in advance, I'd probably have a smarter answer, but the first thing that comes to mind uh, is actually, I mean, it's, it's a flop, it's now kind of famous, but Carrie um, was the first time um, that I was able to dive into the history of a show without having any cast album or even an accessible script. Um, I think it was the book Not Since Carrie by Ken Mendelenbaum, who, whose name I'm probably getting wrong, um, where, you know, he dove into all these flops and I realized, oh, there's so much more out there than the you know, the high school musicals I got to do and all the, the fun experiences, there's so much that goes into this. And I think that was kind of the impetus for like, let me dive in and learn everything about this uh, because it's not always commercial and successful. And that was fascinating to me. And to kind of wrap up, this is just a fun one we throw out there. And especially since maybe there's some ghosts at Fort Salem. <laughs> um, what are some of the hiccups that you've experienced in, in, uh, on stage, either to you personally or someone else, a big whoops that was just kind of uh, fun or frightening? Oh gosh, this, it's funny. I, as a director, every rehearsal, I go around the room at the start. I'm, I say, tell me your name, your character's name. And I have a question of the day. And during tech week, this is one I always ask. Um, and one of my mortifying stories, I so Fiddler on the Roof, I directed, a, I directed and choreographed a production in the round a few years back. And um, during tech week, an actor went MIA. Uh, so I um, had to step in, he was fine. He just, I don't know. Uh, but so he went MIA and I had to step in and 
you know, as a director and a choreographer, I know my material enough to teach it, but then I step back and turn on my editor uh, hat eyes. Um, so I'm up in the show and uh, my husband actually was in this production, which makes this extra funny. So we're in the round and do I'm doing a turning sequence with two other dancers in the middle of to life. And I got up there and I literally, I mean, if, if you're, if you've done choreography, you know, this is often like marking a turn and I was up there and I just noticed myself marking this in a way that I was like, everything is happening in slow motion. I can't get out of this. It's too late. And these poor gentlemen behind me who are thinking that I know this better because I created it now have <laughs> no idea what's going on. Uh, it's, it's mortifying, but uh, also, you know, I think some of those, sometimes those moments are the best stories and I'm getting warm because I'm embarrassed thinking about it now. <laughs> I think we love you more for it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Did, did it all work out? Everybody, nobody got hurt and you all came. It, it did. And I did not drop the bottle off the hat. And that was what was, you know, it, that's, on, that's, it was what, that's what it's all about. <laughs> right? right? Wasn't it glued on? <laughs> it, no, I, no, I, I, that's where my snobby hat comes on. I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. Uh, and if anybody were to drop it, it would have been me. And luckily it wasn't. Now, if I ever produce it, everybody will, because I put that out in the world. So that's on me. <laughs> Well, Kyle, it has been so lovely talking to you. Sadly, our time is uh, wrapping up here, but we are so excited. So tell us, uh, remind us real quick, what's coming up next at Fort Salem? So we actually uh, just added a drag show to our, as our first cabaret series called um, Hello Queen, Halloween. Uh, so that's coming up and actually sold out uh, in just two weeks. Uh, but we have John, a, a John Denver tribute artist uh, named Ted Vigil. Uh, he's touring the country, coming in for one night only, uh, November 26th. Uh, which is the day after Thanksgiving. We have two seats left for that. But then there's no business like snow business, which I love saying. Uh, it's the second weekend of December. So December 10th, 11th, and 12th. And we just opened up tickets for that. And we'll be announcing casting, I think this week. Did you write this or is this a book? It is a uh, more or less a review uh, we're, we're taking all of the holiday songs that have come from musical theater, which is more than you would, you would think. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And that's just kind of a fun way to end our season uh, and kick off the holiday season. That's great. So you're also booking in um, touring acts. We are, we are. We're, we're, trying to, we're trying to do something that gets different people into the theater for different reasons. So uh, musical acts, uh, musical theater plays new works. Maybe we'll do stand-up comedy. Ask me again in in a month. And, you know, again, anything that brings people into the building uh, and gets people excited to kind of share in that experience gets me excited. So we'll give it a try and see what sticks. Ellen, road trip. My car knows how to get there all by itself. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. So you're going to- I'll book your tickets right now. It. <laughs> Kyle, all the best. How wonderful. So glad we could spend this time with you. Thank you so much. Great to meet you both. Absolutely. You too. And uh, for all our listeners, thanks for listening and we'll, uh, we'll catch you next week. Thank you so much for listening to the Everything Theater Podcast. Special thanks goes out to Alice Grinling for our photography and Justin Friello for composing our amazing theme song. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you want to share your thoughts or what's going on in your theater community, you can reach out to us on social media or through our email at everythingtheaterpodcast at gmail.com. Till next time. It's everything, everything, everything.